Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the second session on neutron stars and magnetars at the Chandra Frontiers in Time Domain Science. We have four speakers today joining us, and I'd like to remind you all after this is our last session for today. And tomorrow we have two sessions on active galactic nuclei starting at 9 a.m. Eastern time and 2 p.m. Eastern time. And Friday is the last day of our Challenger Frontiers in Time Domain Science. And we have two sessions on multi-messenger astronomy and the closing event. I hope you can join us for those. So without further ado, I'd like to ask our first speaker to start sharing their slides. Our first speaker is Vicki Caspi coming to us from Miguel University and will talk to us about isolated neutron stars. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, you can see my slide. Yes, looks good. Okay, hello from uh, Montreal, Canada. It's my pleasure to be here um, talking about isolated neutron stars. Um, so one can do a census of uh, non-accreting neutron stars, which is what I take to mean by isolated neutron stars. And one of course starts with the first, arguably the first discovered class of radio pulsars, which are also known as rotation powered pulsars. Of those there's sub, a subclass, the millisecond pulsars, which are the fastest rotating ones likely spun up uh, well, almost certainly spun up by accretion from a binary companion. So they're not really, uh, and, but there are isolated millisecond pulsars. There's of course the magnetars that we heard Nanda give a lovely talk about um, in the last session. Um, those have also gone by the names of anomalous X-ray pulsars and soft gamma repeaters in the past. Today, we tend to just lump them all into the category called magnetars. Now you might think isolated neutron stars, well, is that a different class? Well, that's come to um, uh, be the name of a very specific subset of neutron stars. They used to be called dim isolated neutron stars, sometimes X-ray dim isolated neutron stars. Um, I'll describe those two, but um, they likely are a subset also of radio pulsars. There's a central compact objects that's uh, what appear to be isolated neutron stars inside supernova remnants that have some unusual properties as you heard a little bit about from um, uh, Nanda's talk. There's rotating radio transients, um, which are very, very intermittent uh, radio pulsars, we believe. And of course, there's nowadays we talk a lot about fast radio bursts. Uh, and uh, I put a question mark there. It's, is this, does this also form part of this uh, overall uh, neutron star group, which I've come to like to call the neutron star zoo. And so what we're trying to do in this field is uh, try to understand all of these different objects and perhaps put it together in a single formation, an evolutionary type of framework. So why Chandra observations of isolated neutron stars? Well, we think they help understand the zoo, as I said, um, and uh, identify what are the key formation evolutionary properties, for example, magnetic field uh, and initial spin seem to play major roles. Uh, but also to understand the physics of the neutron star magnetosphere, which is uh, really uh, quite extreme in magnetic field and of course involves also uh, huge gravity. Um, the neutron star interior is also uh, quite interesting, um, trying to understand the uh, unknown equation of state um, uh, at the, uh, of the very dense matter at the centers of neutron stars. And the pulsar also produces a wind, relativistic particle, magnetic field wind that interacts with its environment and, uh, and produces lovely wind nebulae. Um, and then of course, the mysterious fast radio burst that may or may not be part of this whole story. Uh, so X-ray observations are, of all of these are very important. And um, you know, we start with talking about radio pulsars, which as I'm sure pretty much everybody here knows, these are very rapidly rotating neutron stars and the ranges of spin periods we know of today are from 1.6 milliseconds to 23 seconds. The slowest one we know of is, is actually pretty slow. Uh, highly magnetized between 10 to the eight, 10 to the 14. Gauss has inferred from their spin down rate uh, by measuring the spin down rate, the P dot, we can infer the magnetic field. And all of this or almost all of this 
Um, much of it traditionally, we've, of the radiation we've observed from classic radio pulsars, we think is powered by the rate of loss of rotational kinet kinetic energy, the spin down luminosity. Um, these objects are most readily observed in radio waves. There's about almost 3000 now known uh, in the online pulsar catalog. And somewhere between 150 and 200 of these are X-ray detected. Um, now, where do the X-rays come from? There's four main X-ray emission mechanisms. Um, the, uh, one is non-thermal emission from the magnetosphere, from the outside, the outer regions of the uh, neutron star magnetosphere. This is, uh, we think, um, radiating particles accelerated, ripped from the surface, accelerated by the, um, uh, magnetic, the magnetically induced very strong electric fields. Um, there's also thermal emission from the polar caps, which we think are, can be heated by return currents from the magnetospheric um, uh, currents. Uh, so that's also powered by uh, the rotation. Uh, but you can also have thermal emission from the entire surface, possibly extra hot near the polar caps, um, from residual heat following formation in a supernova explosion. So that uh, would be not necessarily powered by the spin down luminosity. That has to do with the source's age. If it's very uh, young, it'll be hotter. Um, there's also a whole uh, bunch of emission of energy that, as you heard about in magnetars, particularly thermal and non-thermal emission that can come from a very strongly strong magnetic field that's decaying. And we think that's relevant only in the high B field sources. And all of that emission is, you can say, contaminated or one person's noise is another person's signal uh, by surrounding nebular emission where the particle wind interacts. And, and of course, the beauty of Chandra for pulsar observations is that it can separate out particularly the nebular emission and also has the uh, spectral and time resolutions to study all the other types of emission. And so just to show you uh, sort of what I mean, the Vila pulsar is one of the archetypes of this field having been detected from optical all the way up to gamma rays. And in particular in the X-rays, you can see with your own eyes, these are light curves over two rotational uh, rotations you can see the non-thermal emission, these sharp pulsations um, at the typically visible at the higher uh, X-ray bands. Uh, and then at the lower X-ray band, the, the thermal emission starts to come in. It seems broader, which is in keeping with the notion that it's coming from the surface. So it's suffering gravitational light bending, uh, whereas the uh, magnetospheric emission, which clearly is um, uh, related to the high energy gamma ray emission uh, is from the outer magnetosphere. And there you can see an example of a pulsar wind nebula. And so a typical pulsar spectrum will have multiple components, the soft black body probably from the surface, a harder black body maybe from the polar caps reheated by magnetospheric currents that come back down and the non-thermal emission, uh, which is those, you know, and, and the, uh, the, the spiky magnetospheric emission that's coming from different, and, and the, there's different uh, places that this emission can be coming from. So the polar cap regions I said could be the hard black body, the whole surface soft, and uh, there's gaps, uh, identified slot gaps or the outer gap um, that uh, can are places of particle acceleration where the non-thermal emission can be produced. And Chandra's done foundational work on many of these radio pulsars, and one could study the spectra and these light curves, but it went sh short of time, so much ground to cover, I thought I'd highlight some of the anomalies and some of the places where I think there's future directions for study. And one of them is a the phenomenon of mode changing pulsars. Um, here's an example of a mode changer. This mode changing is defined by its radio behavior in pulsar 0943 plus 10 has long been known to be mode changer. It has a bright radio mode. Here are radio pulse profiles where it's uh, extremely bright. And then it also has a quiet mode. So that's the B mode is the bright radio mode and the Q mode is the quiet radio mode where it's uh, much fainter in radio. And, and by the way, this mode changing extends um, it, to, to very extreme ratios where you could sometimes see the pulsar extremely brightly and sometimes not even be able to detect it. We call those nullers, but we think that's a form, form of mode changing. And in this 2016, um, sorry, 2013 observation later studied by other groups, uh, Hermsen et al showed that the X-ray emission changes radically depending on what mode the pulsar is in. And the pulsar changes modes on timescales of minutes. Um, so you can see in the beam mode, uh, no pulsations were <laughs> detectable. In the end, 
Um, Marigetti et al. show, there's actually are faint, very faint pulsations there. But in the Q mode, the quiet radio mode is when the X-ray pulsar gets really bright. And this sort of flies in the face of everything I've told you uh, before that uh, if you're thinking about emission and, and long standing um, structures in the magnetosphere on the surface of the star that should be always present, not sh shifting around radically on time scales of minutes. So this was a, a quite um, a puzzling observation. I don't think we've really gotten to the bottom of it yet. We don't really understand it. And I point it out because um, we are going to be in a new era of time domain astronomy, um, thanks in, uh, for uh, the one, of, one reason is the Chime Fast Radio Burst Project I'll describe later, which has a huge area and is constantly surveying the sky and it's finding lots and lots of mode changing pulsars, which I think will be great fodder for these types of X-ray studies uh, in the future. Um, another key question that's come from X-ray studies of radio pulsars has been trying to constrain the equation of state of uh, neutron star interiors. And here is a plot of um, the uh, luminosity versus age, for example. You could also plot temperature versus age. And you see all sorts of different models that depend on, uh, that, that, that come about from different types of uh, uh, um, equations of state. This beautiful, beautiful theoretical work that's been done uh, by many people. Uh, and Chandra's legacy here has been the high angular resolution because it can separate out nebular emission, which can contaminate. Now, as we heard in the Magnetar talk, and, and you can see in this plot, there's lots of sources that have this extra heating going on uh, so that when you try and measure the thermal emission, it's contaminated either, not maybe, maybe you can separate the nebul nebular emission, but it's hard sometimes to separate out the surface, um, the polar cap emission from the surface emission uh, uh, or thermal emission that's caused by internal heating due to decaying magnetic fields. Uh, so some of the most constraining observations actually come from the dimmest sources you can detect with Chandra, for example, Slain et al. Uh, beautiful observations of 3C58 um, uh, neutron star, the neutron star in the supernova in 3C58, which is, has very, very low temperature, which then is extremely constraining the equation of states. Uh, whereas other sources, um, even if they're brighter, are, are less constraining because you'd never, you know, it's hard to separate out the, um, the contam uh, contaminants. Now, one person's, as I said, one person's contaminants, another person's um, signal, and some of these pulsar window really, first of all, are specta visually spectacular, but also teach us a huge amount about the pulsar wind. For example, it's highly anisotropic, it has jets, it has a clear toroidal component. Um, wh what you see here is just a, a, a small, um, uh, sampling of tremendous work Chandra has done over the years. Uh, and I tried to choose the, you know, a, a diversity of morphologies. These morphologies are defined both by the size of the spin down luminosity and how anisotropic the pulsar wind is, um, also by the pulsar's rotational axis orientation, which we believe um, uh, is responsible for the jet direction. Whether or not there's a supernova remnant present because the uh, wind material can interact with that supernova remnant, the local environment density, and also the pulsar proper motion, where sometimes the pulsar nebular emission is totally dominated by that ram pressure interaction between the wind and the ambient density um, uh, due to very high uh, uh, velocities. R radio pulsars have extremely high velocities, sometimes upwards of a thousand kilometers per second. So you can see these structures. And then they're also, of course, all defined by time and, and uh, the time domain conference. Important to note that uh, there's beautiful Chandra observations of time variable pulsar winds like this one in the, in the Vila pulsar. Uh, one of the most interesting aspects of this time variability are these asymmetric outflows in some of these pulsar wind nebulae. And I have to thank George Pavlov for pointing some of these out to me. I, I wasn't aware of this as I prepared for the talk. I, uh, he, 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 pointed me to some of these really amazing. There's the Guitar Nebula Pulsar. It's a radio pulsar with a very high thousand kilometer per second velocity up in the direction of this little line. The pulsar is over here and you can see the H alpha nebula behind it looks like a guitar. But the X-ray shows something totally different. This um, uh, outflow that is totally misaligned, you might say, how do you know it's even aligned with, it? how do you know it's even related with the pulsar? Well, because in proper motion, in, in observations over multiple years, you can see the pulsar moving on the sky 
and that line of X-ray emission moves with it. So uh, the origin of this is, is quite unclear. Uh, perhaps it could be related to the pulsar jet, uh, but you might think it ought to be shaped a little bit by ram pressure as well. Uh, other cases where you can see um, X-ray emission that is misaligned with the proper motion, again, from this 15 to 9 minus 5850 observation, and uh, the Lighthouse Nebula, another uh, spectacular one where the proper motion is down here, and you see this totally misaligned outflow. It's a big puzzle, and I think um, it's not quite time domain in the sense these are there, but following it, seeing the proper motion, seeing if it evolves with time, I think is, could be very telling. You heard a lot about central compact objects uh, in Nanda's talk. Uh, these are also indeed a major Chandra legacy. Uh, a few of them, uh, you know, it's basically consists of isolated neutron stars inside the supernova remnant. Uh, the nature of some of these central sources is, uh, is unclear. Uh, it's probably a mixed bag. Some have a PNP dot measured. Uh, for example, this supernova remnant here, KES 79, uh, and it has a very low magnetic field. So this is uh, in consciousness, some people have ca called them anti-magnetars because their fields are so low. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I like that terminology because a magnetar produces so much emission because of its decaying magnetic field. Here, it's not clear what role the magnetic field plays, if any, in the emission of the neutron star. Um, what's curious is um, in a PP dot diagram uh, where all these are radio pulsars, the black dots are radio pulsars and the CCOs, um, a few of them that have measured P and P dots, in some cases the P dots are just upper limits. Um, as you could see, they're, they're quite low um, and uh, imply low magnetic fields like this source over here, uh, but they're all in supernova remnants. I think this is really important. One, one point that is uh, often ignored, they're in supernova remnants and they're young remnants, uh, you know, less than a few, uh, one or 2000 years. Uh, and, that, and, and we know of about eight of these. Uh, and if you have so many that have been born recently and they have very low magnetic fields, that means they take forever to evolve on the PP dot diagram. The standard way, w w w the way pulsars evolve, if their magnetic fields don't decay and at these fields you don't expect it, they should just move along lines of constant magnetic field in this diagram defined by PNP dot. In which case you would expect to see a buildup of sources near what we call the death line. That is, as they move downward, you should see lots and lots of these if they are, become radio pulsars. These CCOs aren't seen to produce radio emission. And I think all you would need is to see radio emission from one of them and you'd have quite a problem because we've seen very few radio pulsars in that region, even though we should be seeing millions of them in the galaxy. Um, Nanda also already mentioned this, so I think I'll, I'll skip it, except just to say the CCO, like I say, some of these might be a mixed bag, uh, magnetar-like outburst from a 6.6 hour X-ray pulsar inside the supernova remnant. Now, how do you get uh, isolated neutron stars spinning at 6.67 hours? That uh, seems very strange. No evidence for binarity. Uh, why would it undergo a huge magnetar outburst like this? Also very curious, very, very interesting source. Uh, and one quick addendum to the CCO story, uh, there was a reported CCO in uh, this famous SMC, super oxygen rich supernova remnant. Um, it was thought this object here could be a, a CCO. It had an interesting optical ring structure and uh, appeared to be a compact uh, point source. Uh, Long et al. recently showed that not is more likely to be supernova remnant um, emission and not quite consistent with the PSF. Uh, but I think a deep uh, uh, Chandra observation of this would be really interesting. Now, this unification picture, uh, you know, I think Nanda stressed this a lot, and I want to uh, mention, mention it as well. The idea is that what connects radio pulsars, these isolated neutron stars, radio pulsars to magnetars, is the magnetic field. And so transition objects should exist, and there's theoretical grounds for thinking this. And indeed, we've seen now magnetar metamorphoses where rotation powered pulsars like 1846 minus 0258 uh, has a huge X-ray outburst out of the blue and shows lots of X-ray bursts, as you can see here. Um, uh, the, the pulsar got visibly brighter uh, at that time. Other evidence of this sort of unification, uh, you can look at temperature versus age and split these neutron stars by magnetic field strength. So if you take the radio pulsars 
and you split them, the red ones have high magnetic field greater than 10 to the 13 Gauss, which is an arbitrary cutoff, and the blue have magnetic fields lower than 10 to the 13 Gauss, you can see the red ones tend to be on average a little hotter for the same age uh, than the blue ones. Uh, and the magnetars, of course, are, are way up, up here. Uh, and uh, in terms of time domain science, what's the future? I think continuing to be vigilant for looking for uh, X-ray outbursts from high magnetic field radio pulsars at the times of glitches or otherwise just randomly that is something that you would expect. Uh, we saw it, in, as I said, in one source. We've also seen it, why won't you go forward there, in a second radio pulsar, a magnetar-like outburst from the high magnetic field, young radio pulsar 1119 minus 6127. In 2016, it had an X-ray outburst. You can see it got uh, quite bright, 100 times brighter in the X-rays, and it had a bunch of magnetar-like X-ray bursts the radio pulse profile suddenly changed, it had a glitch. And in this case, I just wanna highlight something very interesting. Uh, during the, X, the brief X-ray bursts, the radio emission, which you can see here, it's the, the individual pulses are, are so close together on this time scale that you can't quite see them, but you can see this huge gap. The radio emission actually shut off at the time of the X-ray burst. Uh, perhaps the pair plasma um, that's produced in the X-ray burst, is thought to produce in the X-ray burst, interrupts the acceleration of the radio emitting particles. That's, that's possible. But it's sort of uh, curious that you do not see the radio emission at the time of X-ray outburst, and, and, and at least in this source. Um, and just finally, in terms of transition objects, these isolated neutron stars, Nanda mentioned that these are the ones that uh, sit here in the PP dot diagram, the pink boxes. There's only about eight of these known. They don't show radio emission. They have long periods in high-ish magnetic fields, uh, but they're all quite close and pretty hot as if, um, and you know, why should these very nearby neutron stars all have high-ish magnetic fields? Well, the thought is they're actually off-axis radio pulsars that were previously magnetars and still are kept hot by uh, residual heat from field decay. Uh, they have interesting time evolution in some of their X-ray spectra for time. I just wanted to mention that for this time domain conference. Um, and so this sort of unification picture, and Ananda already mentioned this, but uh, you have your radio pulsars in this, in this diagram where you have log of the magnetic field on the y-axis, log of age on the x-axis. And you could see radio pulsars sort of sits in this region, the young low field pulsar CCOs, at least the CCOs like CAS79, I don't know about R3, RCW103, um, sits down here. And uh, you have the magnetars way up here, young high magnetic fields. And then you have the transition objects like the 1119, minus 6127, those pulsars that will suddenly seem like radio pulsars suddenly have uh, outbursts. And then the isolated neutron stars, perhaps they are higher field, but older uh, radio pulsars seen off axis. So this could be one picture of this unification. And future time domain studies, of magnetar-like outbursts from radio pulsars, from isolated neutron stars, and of course from CCOs will be, I think, really valuable. Uh, and so I think in the last few minutes, I would like just to switch gears slightly uh, to fast radio bursts. Um, I don't feel too badly doing this in a pulsar talk because if you check the most highly cited paper on ADS that has both Chandra and pulsar in the abstract is an FRB paper. Uh, this one uh, uh, reporting on multi-wavelength observations of a repeating FRB. And it's a non-detection paper, the most highly cited Chandra Pulsar paper since 2012. I think that's kind of funny. Uh, so fast radio bursts, what are they for those of you not familiar? These are brief, that is few millisecond bursts of radio uh, uh, waves. Uh, the first one was discovered in 2007. Today, there's about a hundred of them published. And you can see here, we know we define them by their dispersion measure, that is uh, the degree of dispersion in a frequency versus time plot. The horizontal line here is a TV station. This is the pulsar, this is the FRB uh, sweeping through. Its dispersion measure is much greater than that uh, in the Milky Way galaxy. So it has to be something that is uh, extra galactic and indeed for many of the dispersion measures, cosmological. The estimated sky rate of these is about a thousand per sky per day. This is not something uncommon. This is ubiquitous in the universe, but their origin is unknown. Some of them repeat. The first repeater was found at 121102. 
Uh, it certainly rules out cataclysmic models for this source. We've now seen hundreds of bursts over years from this, but it also enabled with the first localization, the confirmation that it's coming from a gigaparsec that is a cosmological uh, distance. The leading model for these, as you've heard, is magnetars, a young magnetar, although why they should be producing so bright radio waves is, is, is a mystery. Uh, until recently, we hadn't seen that. Three minutes. Uh, sorry, what was that? Three minutes. Yeah, so uh, until recently, um, uh, so the first Chandra observations that that highly cited paper I mentioned did not detect any X-ray emission at the time of radio bursts. Um, uh, unsurprising for a source at a gigaparsec. And you can set interesting upper limits. This is a plot of burst energy as a fun, uh, uh, the, the, the energy um, uh, uh, of the burst at different photon energies. This is from Schultz et al. Really these limits here are not very constraining. On the other hand, the CHIME FRB experiment, uh, you can see it here. This is a new radio telescope we've built in Canada. It's four 20 meter by 100 meter cylinders oriented north, south and fixed so that there's a transit telescope. You have to see the sky as it goes overhead, which means that we see the entire Northern sky every day. Uh, we have a thousand independent beams on the sky. It's like having a thousand GBTs all at the same time. And we're doing a real time FRB and single pulse search uh, using this. We found 18 new repeaters. We've actually found much more and we were working on publishing more of them. Uh, but one of them was uh, we uh, localized by the European VLBI network uh, to a spiral galaxy at a distance of only 150 megaparsecs, so much closer than the original repeater. Uh, we got Chandra time to look at it. And you can see here the radio burst happened. There was a radio burst detected by Chime. That's a little black arrow. At the time of Chandra observations, we were really, really excited. Unfortunately, there was no detection. Uh, and we set a luminosity upper limit of 10 to the 45 ergs per second. It's starting to get a little bit more constraining. Um, it's not hugely constraining yet. You can see the burst energies are coming down a little bit. Uh, I think this is more, even more relevant with the detection of SGR 1935 uh, plus 24 by Chime FRB and the STAIR-2 experiment. You'll hear from Chris Bahanek about that shortly. It had a coincident hard x-ray burst with a 10 to the 40 uh, erg energy, um, which isn't that bright as, as x-ray bursts go, but as radio bursts go, this was super bright, totally. We detected it in 91 of our 1024 beams. You can see here in a plot of the radio fluence uh, and here versus distance, uh, these are lines of constant burst energy. And you see, it's still a little low compared to even the lowest energy uh, FRBs that we know of, but it sure is very um, uh, suggestive that uh, at least some FRBs are, um, are uh, uh, magnetars. Uh, the brightest ever uh, X-ray burst seen from a magnetar was 10 to the 46 ergs. So we are starting to have really good chance of detecting X-ray bursts from FRBs. And I'm happy to tell you about a new Chime FRB repeater that is, uh, we know has a maximum redshift of 0.06, very low dispersion measure, but it has a very bright big spiral galaxy in the error region uh, that has a low probability of being there, uh, certainly less than 1%. And that host galaxy NGC 3252 is only at 20 megaparsecs away. This is work by grad student Mohit Bardwaj uh, and our CHIME team uh, that should be coming out hopefully soon. Uh, it's what's delaying us is that there are still other galaxies in the error region that do have, do have redshifts greater than our inferred maximum redshift, but those are only photometric redshifts. So we're not 100% sure that they're not also consistent with being the source of the, um, of the repetition. We don't have an interferometric lo localization yet. So this is our error region. Uh, it is not a frequent repeater, unfortunately. We've only seen it at two epochs. But I can tell you Chime FRB has a lot more low FRB, uh, uh, sorry, low DM FRBs uh, to come. And uh, we're hoping that we'll be able to identify more really nearby galaxies to be able to do uh, X-ray follow-up on. So in summary, huh, Chandra already has uh, quite a legacy of landmark neutron star results, uh, but there's many open and new questions for Chandra to tackle in the next decade, particularly with an eye toward time domain science. This grand unification, studying of pulsars, mode changers, nullers, 
uh, looking at time variability of pulsar wind nebulae, looking for outbursts from isolated neutron stars and high magnetic field radio pulsar CCOs, and I think potentially major progress on nearby FRBs in the next few years. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much for an excellent talk and very interesting work uh, and new work to come, I'm sure. Uh, we have a question from Pranav Ghosh. What would be a good way to further test the young magnetar model of FRBs against observations? Would polarization studies help? And particularly in view of the recent work on ST2004-28A. Two, 20, uh, yeah, so polarization of fast radio bursts is a, is a major topic. Uh, so far, the results have been a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, there are um, lots of FRBs that are very, very highly polarized. Uh, and um, some have position angles. Uh, so some are very linearly polarized. You can measure the position angle uh, of that polarization. In many cases, that position angle is quite uh, flat. So if you have a model where you have a rotating neutron star, you might expect a bit of a position angle swing. You do see that in some cases, but not in others. In the case of synchrotron maser emission from a region way outside a magnetar, as in the Metzger uh, Margalit type models, uh, there you would you, you don't expect to see rapid position angle variability in the, in the in polarization swings, which you do see in some cases, but not in all cases. So like I say, it's a little bit confusing. And, and further polarization is, um, I mean, now I, you'll have to, I'll go on and on, but polarization is super interesting also for detecting rotation measures. At least one repeater has a, in fact, the original 121102 repeater has a really high rotation measure, 10 to the five in normal rotation measure units. Um, other repeaters have not shown such a high rotation measure. Uh, they've, they've all, some have been rotation measures consistent with the galactic component. Um, on the other hand, sometimes rotation measures are variable. So there's a lot, there's a big story to unravel there and unpack. Um, I can't do it justice here, but I'll just say it is a really interesting uh, and um, blossoming uh, research area. Great. If you, if you have any questions for our speaker, please put them into the Q&A. And panelists, if you have a question, you can enter it into the chat or raise your hand. Oh, and I think Pran, I've also asked about the uh, magnet, the outburst, uh, the, the radio burst from 12, um, SGR 9035. Um, I guess uh, Chris will talk about it, but in, in Chime, we, um, we did not have uh, polarization data for that event for complicated technical reasons, but we did detect it with the Algonquin radio telescope triggered by the chime trigger. And we did get some polarization information there. Perhaps uh, Chris will talk about that. So I don't want to steal his thunder, but um, there is polarization in that one also. It's, it's pretty linearly polarized. Um, if I remember correctly from a, a slide in Nanda's talk uh, where she showed some F FRB-like radio outbursts, they were following an X-ray outburst in some magnetars. Uh, is it possible that the trigger is the wrong way <laughs> and that the right x-rays would be first and the radio outburst later? Right, so I think, I think it's important to, um, um, it's very tempting and, and I find myself doing it, but it, one, one has to hesitate briefly at least between um, you know, taking any uh, magnetar radio emission and calling it FRB-like. Mm -hmm. The FRBs are, are billions to more, way more than billions times, you know, it's ten, ten to, let's say millions to billion times more luminous. Um, and even the SGR burst, which was so, so bright, uh, still, like I said, it, it's, it's luminosity, its energy is, is not quite in the FRB range. It's almost there. So I think it's tempting to say some are, but there's a lot of radio emission. It might not be, um, it might not be FRB like, mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, Many magnetars produce radio emission that's similar to radio pulsars, and we we, know, we haven't gone and said, oh, these are you know, um, it's the same emission mechanism, um, or even the same energy source. Uh, it's it's really not clear yet. But as you said, um, the way the trigger goes, typically in a magnetar, the radio emission comes on after the X-ray outburst. So yeah, you could be right. I mean, I, it, it's a fair point. Um, well, time will tell. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, we have a question from Nanda. If you can define FRB like, 
well, how would you do it? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a fine question. I mean, we could sit around and we do uh, here at McGill and argue about it all the time. Um, I think, first of all, there's, there's also another important difference that we see in repeater radio emission and magnetar radio bursts. And, and it's very obvious right there in the SGR 1935 burst. Um, uh, you know, they tend to, so, so they, um, uh, typical radio emission from magnetar is broadband. You see it over many, many radio frequencies. Whereas if you look at our repeater papers from Chime FRB, the emission tends to be quite narrow band. And it's a little awkward in our plots of this because um, our telescope has, uh, the band pass is really complicated. So sometimes you'll see it be narrow band, it's not really narrow band. So you have to sort of um, take my word for it. We have a big magnetar catalog that's about to come out and in there um, uh, it'll be a little more, a little clearer, but it's already sort of clear in um, existing, th uh, existing data. So, so the FRB emission from repeaters, from non-repeaters is, is a little different. So right there, right, even among FRBs, it's hard to define what the radio emission is exactly is, is like, but I think luminosity has got to be, right. you know, the key number. Right. Great. Thanks a lot for excellent talk and excellent Q&A. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker. If you can share your slides now. Our next speaker is Jean-Luca Israel from INAF, Astronomical Observatory of Roma, and will talk to us about the Chandra ACES Timing Survey Project, Cats at Bar. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to report on the results of the Chandra ACES Timing Survey Project, which we started in 2012. Uh, what I'm going to show you is uh, why and how we believe that searching for coherent signal in a huge database like the one of Chandra is very interesting. And I will of course show you the, the sample of the new pulsator, which actually is a 50 object that is still counting because this is a living project. And uh, I will also show preliminary results of a comparison between the what we call the cats at bar, which is our project with a similar one done uh, for the XMM archive. I will also show you some particularly interesting cases related to the Neutrostar, since this is a, a Neutrostar section. And we, um, a couple of uh, properties of the overall, overall properties of our sample, and plus uh, our attempt to sort out the right uh, nature of the signal based on optical follow up um, spectroscopy. So let me just start saying that at the very beginning, when you are talking about signal, coherent signal, and this means timing. And timing means the characteristic time scales. And characteristic time scales of what? Of the, of the particularly um, object you are dealing with and with the um, mechanism which are originating this kind of signal. So when you are talking about signal, we are talking about the physics of this uh, object and uh, emissions. So for example, when you are uh, detecting orbital period or superorbital period, you can infer important information about the nature of the, of the binary system. Therefore, for example, high mass versus low mass X-ray binaries, plus other information like the sizes of the mission region and all the, um, the masses and the inclination of the system and so on. Also, if you are lucky, you are able to follow the orbital evolution, which are information about the and mass transfer rates and the gravitational wave emission. Uh, similarly, similarly, similar reasoning also apply for in the case of the spin periods, because spin periods, uh, in this case, of course, of neutron star and white dwarf, uh, allow you to also sort out the nature of the signal of, of, the, the, of the compact object, neutron star versus white dwarf, and so on. So let me start saying that one of the main reasons for which we started this um, project is when, when you look at the typical uh, observation, Chandra and both, and also XMM observation, you can have uh, uh, several tens of serendipitous sources per field. And in many cases, for the greatest part of these serendipitous sources, there are few or no timing information available. Starting from this point, we are 
decide to do this kind of searches with two main aims. The first one is to search for new classes of X-ray pulsator or um, peculiar object in very rare evolutionary path. This is because every time we attempt this kind of search, we find something interesting. This is, for example, the case of, of many years ago, Exosat, yes. Uh, for example, when we, for the first time, um, uh, were able to uh, dis dis uh, discover the, the, for the first time, pulsation from 410142, which is a, one of the prototype of the magnetar class, but also in Rosat, when we, there are, we detected, for example, a very uh, unusual, uh, massive white dwarf in a post common and enveloped phase, or like AMGNC, which is a, a double degenerate white dwarf binary system with a currently the shortest orbital period we know, which is only five or four minutes. And the second point is, of course, the possibility to extending the luminosity interval over which the physics of the accretion can be investigated, which means a close object low luminosity and, uh, uh, fa uh, let's say, high luminosity, but in uh, nearby galaxies. Now, how do we perform this kind of search? We decide to um, rely upon a very well assessed algorithm, which is the fast Fourier transform, but we decide to have something different, which is what we call a, a, a sort of local threshold, which is this green line here, for each fast Fourier transform. This is because uh, it's the, uh, a, in a systematic and automatic way, which allow us to take into account all the noises component, which can be present in a fast Fourier transform, not only the white noise, which is generally the one over which people uh, start defining the standard threshold. And this, or, or different from the, the assumption of taking the maximum power uh, in fast Fourier transform. Like in this example, these two approaches, the standard approaches are, will be wrong. Now, so CASABA stands for Chandra Achis Timing Survey at Brera and Rome Astronomical Observatory is a pipeline which basically do a bit of everything. I will not enter into the detail. And, but I want to just to show you it is based on the SSI and S archive. So it means only imaging observation. So far we um, analyzed 14,000 pointings, uh, more than 100,000 times uh, series were searched for signal. And we found something like uh, 260,000 peaks. But the greatest part of these peaks are well known in the sense that are spurious and related to the dithering, um, dithering pattern um, are, are along the on axis, uh, the point, the on axis uh, pointing of Chandra. So uh, if you start filtering these uh, amounts, huge amount of peaks, uh, significant peaks uh, for the instrumental signal, and removing the real signal from a non pulsator, you end up with about something like 100 uh, peaks, which is something more reasonable. These 100 peaks uh, correspond to about uh, 50 new, no, about, sorry, to 50 new pulsators. Uh, in, within the catalog, we have a bit of everything, like you can see from this uh, um, list. We have a transient, neutral star transient in small Magellanic clouds. We have accreting neutro star persistent in the galactic plane. We have CVs in globular cluster and also in open cluster. We have four signal in external galaxy and so on. For the greatest part of them, we don't still don't know which is the, the real nature of the signal. This is because of the, there is a need. I mean, the, the, in many cases, we have only few observations uh, to rely upon. So we don't are able to completely do, sort out the nature. Um, now, if you look at the main properties of the sample, you can clearly see, for example, that for long period object, they seem to be basically dominated by the properties of a cataclysmic variable in, the play, in, in our galaxy, because the, the peak, the bulk of the periods is around 100 minutes, which is more or less what we expected from the known population of cataclysmic variable. Uh, one can ask if, this is something um, related only to the Chandra capability or is something more um, natural, let's say. 
And this can be done by comparing our results with similar results obtained for the XMM Newton catalog. And you can clearly see that there is, a, as expected, a difference in the peak uh, flux, if about a factor of um, um, five in flux. But if you look at the period again, we are almost, almost at the same value of the period. So this means that this should be something intrinsically in the sky, and this is definitely probably related to the cataclysmic variable population. One can also ask uh, where um, Chandra is making the difference. And in particular, you can clearly see that, as expected again, uh, there is a, a better, Chandra is better for low fluxes, uh, pulsators, but a bit unexpected also for very long periods. Um, and this is probably due to the fact that the stability of a background in a Chandra is definitely superior with respect to the XMM1, which is affected by the proton flares. Now, something which I would like to mention uh, briefly is the fact that in both uh, the sample, there is a, a basically the lack of uh, low flux short period new pulsators. Probably, we don't know exactly what is the reason. We speculate that probably this is related to what we call the magnetic gating on propeller effect in magnetic neutron star, which means that if you have short period objects which are accreting, you need more um, accretion rate in order to have the signals, uh, I mean, the accretion to the neutron star and therefore the signal. The problem with this reasoning is in general that this is uh, uh, done in terms of luminosity, not flux, while here we have flux, sorry. And this means that we need the distance in order to confirm this, uh, this scenario. Three minutes. Thanks. Uh, a couple of particularly interesting cases uh, for neutron stars. Uh, I would like to, um, to focus on this object here, which is AXJ1910, which is an IMAS X-ray binary. This is a persistent object. And we detected the uh, 36,200 sec uh, second signal, which we believe it to be related to the spin period of the neutron star, which in this case would be the longest one. And this is because uh, there is also an optical identification is a super giant B star at 16 kiloparsec. And there are no uh, way to, I mean, to put uh, such a binary system in an orbital period with uh, 36,200 seconds. The second one is still, uh, uh, let's say, one of, I mean, is I'm showing this one in order just to give you an idea of the potentiality of this kind of uh, studies, because, for example, this is a very likely high mass X-ray binary. So we detected a very likely, again, even though it's a close to free sigma, but is a first period derivative, which is suggesting that the uh, 5,700, 5,800 seconds is likely due to the um, neutral spin neutral star. Given the luminosity, uh, sorry, the flux uh, of this object, it is very likely an object similar to X per se, which means uh, long period, low flux and low luminosity. Uh, another thing we are trying to, we are tempting is the following. Uh, for example, for all the signal with periods in between 3,000 to 100,000 um, seconds, you can try to do a sort of phase resolve time resolve spectroscopy of the optical counterpart, which we identified thanks to the, 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 the capability of Chandra of uh, having a very narrow uncertainty on the position. And when you find that emission lines are following a, a pattern, a modulation pattern with the same uh, period of X-ray seeing, you know, you can conclude that this is an orbital modulator. So this is a, a way to sort out, at least in this range of period, uh, orbital period from spin period. Of course, if you don't see nothing, you cannot really tell that this is a, a spin, but you cannot say anything else. Now, the takeaway of this talk are the following. This is a, this is a project, is a living project because we are um, routinely um, um, doing uh, the analysis every few months of uh, new archival data. We've so far, we obtained 50 new pulsators. Uh, we, uh, we think that the slow pulsators are mainly cataclysmic variable, even though there are notable exceptions, like for example, the case of AXJ1910. 
uh, we will so notice a lack of low flux, low, uh, slow, low flux, low pulsator, which could be related for a propeller effect. And we also have, no, we have seen that there are similar results obtained from the XM and pulsator, though Chandra are definitely better suited for the study of low, low flux and long period pulsator. And finally, I have not time to talk about the byproduct of this kind of studies, which is a comprehensive mapping of the acid spurious signal. But I just want to, to, to stress that uh, when you have your own data, please look at all the objects you have in your, in, your, um, in your field of view and try to also to use the data region chow task in order to assess whether a signal is real or spurious. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gianluca. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, if you have any questions, please enter them into the uh, into the um, Q and A box. I have a question about how you bring in new observations, and if you also are using, um, if you have observations in across multiple obs IDs of the same field, are you using all of the observations, or do you just do individual? No, we are, well, the, the first approach is the one of applying the, the algorithm for the single observation. What we have done is not to, uh, let's say, use a number of trials, for example, for the assessment of the statistical significant, uh, significance of the peak, not based on the whole sample, but of the single fast Fourier transform. This for two reasons. First, because we don't know exactly which is, which is the number, the total final number of Fourier for frequencies of the world search. But also because we want to use uh, this value we found to look for our Chandra or XMM or whatever our archival data to check whether this signal is present in our observation. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. I think that's all the time that we have uh, for questions. I'd like the next speaker to start sharing their slides. Uh, our next speaker is Alicia Rocco Escorial from Sierra Northwestern University and will talk to us about crust cooling emission from high magnetic field neutron stars in BE X-ray transients. Thank you, Rodolfo. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Alicia Rocco Escorial, and I'm a postdoc at Sierra uh, Northwestern University. And today I will be talking about cross cooling emission from high magnetic field neutron stars in BX ray transients. Well, BX ray transients are binaries that harbor high magnetic field neutron stars that orbit around BE type stars. And these stars generally present an equatorial decretion disk made of spell material from the star. We can find two types of transient behavior in these systems, uh, type one outbursts that occur when the neutron star crosses the degradation disk of the star and accretes material from it near periastron. As you can see here in the light here, we detect the outbursts uh, at uh, periastron. And type two outbursts that are unrelated to the periastron passages and last longer than the orbital period. As you can see here, they last more like these three pe uh, orbital periods and are much more luminous than type 1 uh, outbursts. However, uh, we are interested in studying the behavior of these systems at low X-ray luminosity states, and especially uh, the emission detected from the neutron star at, a, at Apastron. So in low magnetic field neutron stars uh, before accretion, grass and core are in thermal equilibrium. And during accretion, the grass heats up and the thermal equilibrium is broken. Once the accretion stops, uh, the grass tries to restore the thermal equilibrium with the core by releasing the excess of energy uh, that we detect as a thermal emission. And thanks to the study of this emission, we get to obtain information about the core and the grass physics. However, uh, for high magnetic field internal stars, we don't know how the strength and the structure of the magnetic field affects the heating and cooling processes. So that for investigating this, uh, we have observed several high magnetic field uh, systems. We follow ERWJ 1750 after its two type outbursts using Chandra, and we obtained five observations that uh, were detected under the uh, below the Chandra upper, upper limit that uh, was obtained for the system uh, a few years ago. At first, we thought that we uh, potentially detected grass cooling emissions since the light cube decay, 
But however, the light curve rose up again, and this rising is very difficult to explain in the cooling scenario. To investigate this uh, variability at the lowest ray luminosity level, we compare the behavior of 1750 to another two systems with similar basic source parameters and for which uh, we detected cooling emission, 4U0115 and B0332. As you can see here, the 4U and B sources uh, show temporal decay in luminosity and in temperature. However, no significant uh, changes in luminosity and temperature were shown for seen for 1750. So the difference in the cooling behavior of 1750 may be either because the system did not accrete as much matter as the two other and therefore didn't get as much heated up, or maybe this, is not emis this emission is not due to cooling. So for the first case, uh, we calculated the bad fluencies and saw that 1750 was the system that accreted the most and the longest, and 4U was the one that accreted the least. However, the 4U source uh, source cooling emission and the 1750 does not. The other reason may be that we are not detecting uh, cooling emission, but very low level accretion. Vertical lines, as you can see here, represents uh, the time of the periastron passage, and we see that two detections were obtained close to this periastron, allowing for maybe a low level accretion. However, in this scenario, it is difficult to explain the detection, uh, this first detection at Apastron and is far away from the depression of the companion. So here I leave my conclusions. Thanks to the Chandra observations, uh, we, uh, we found out that the behavior of 7050, a low X-ray luminosity state, is different than for the other two sources that show cooling emission. And for understanding better the heating and cooling processes of such high magnetic field uh, sources, we need to expand the number of sources since, sources since we only have three. And for studying and characterizing the cooling phase of these systems and the very low uh, level accretion, we need the high quality Chandra spectra and the stream sensitivity of this uh, uh, observatory for studying these faint sources. Thank you very much for your time and for listening. Thank you, that was excellent. If we have any questions, we have time for a quick question. Um, a question from Solon Ballman. What is the B and spin of this source compared to the other ones you compared with? So that's a good, very good question. Uh, so for these uh, three sources, the uh, spin period is around three and four seconds. Uh, magnetic field are 10 to the 12, both of like, for the three systems. Um, for we expect to detect cooling emission for this what we call fast spinning uh, PX ray transients uh, because uh, for those that are the has uh, let's say uh, the sp, uh, spin period is uh, longer uh, we don't detect, we don't expect that these systems enter in what we were calling propeller regime and also Jean Lucas talk about this so we need these systems to enter in propeller regime and for that we need fast spinning neutron stars and high magnetic fields. Great, thank you. I'll ask our next speaker to start sharing the slides. Our next speaker is Chris Bohanek from Caltech, who will talk to us about a fast radio burst associated with a galactic magnetar. Yeah, um, so, yeah, I wanted to talk to you today about this very exciting result that we uh, recently got with uh, an instrument that I've built as the main part of my PhD thesis, uh, which is which was kind of designed to find these extremely bright and extremely rare fast radio transients, uh, like a galactic fast radio burst. But I can't say we ever seriously thought that we would detect something like this. Um, so. Uh, yeah, I'll get into talking about this fast radio burst that's associated with a uh, known galactic magnetar. So I want to start with the instrument, the Survey for Transient Astronomical Radio Emission 2, or STAIR-2, uh, which consists of three antennas made out of a six-inch pipe and two literal cake pans uh, located at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, the Goldstone Deep Space Communications Complex, and uh, near a town called Delta in Utah. And the whole idea behind this experiment is to trade the sensitivity you get when you observe with a radio dish for the field of view of a radio dipole to catch extremely bright and extremely rare fast radio transients, such as uh, a fast radio burst in the Milky Way. 
With our feed design, we have sensitivity to about a quarter of the sky at any given time, uh, but are only sensitive to one millisecond bursts above 150 kilojansky in the best case scenario, which is right overhead at zenith. And if you're not used to thinking about Jansky, uh, then a typical fast radio burst is detected at about one Jansky. So the signals we're sensitive to are orders and orders of magnitude brighter uh, than a typical fast radio burst. So our stations are spread out over a wide area across the United States, and you can see the light travel time uh, between the stations in this figure. Um, and the reason we have multiple stations is primarily to filter out RFI and boost our confidence in any signal that would be detected. Uh, each station runs an independent search and doesn't talk to each other, uh, except to compare candidates. So if a single station finds something, but there's nothing in the other two uh, within about a light travel time, then we can ignore that candidate as it's probably uh, radio frequency interference. So we observe in the 1.4 gigahertz band, which is a popular band for FRB searches, and the combination of time and frequency resolution is among the best when compared to other fast radio burst experiments. And we search a wide range of dispersion measures out to about 3000 uh, parsecs per centimeter cubed and are sensitive to uh, transients on the time scale of 65 microseconds to 34 milliseconds. Uh, we run an automated search that must find any signal within 13 seconds, otherwise the data will just be thrown out. And then we compare candidates at different stations uh, to look for coincidences. Uh, and then I compile a report daily early in the morning, uh, which I uh, then review every morning. So on April 28th, something a bit strange happened, uh, which was that we actually made a detection. Uh, this burst happened at 7.34 a.m. Uh, Los Angeles time, and within 13 seconds, the burst was indeed found by each of our three stations independently and saved to disk. Uh, and this burst was tremendously bright, as it's not every day you get to use units of Megajansky uh, to describe something other than the sun. Um, and this burst indeed had a fluence of 1.5 megajansky milliseconds and a, a dispersion measure that is consistent with originating from within the galaxy. So this figure sets the scene for this burst. Uh, on the right here, we have the sky at altitude and azimuth at Owens Valley. And these three arcs here correspond to a single stair two baseline's localization region. Uh, and you can see that uh, the localization is consistent with the known magnetar 1935 plus uh, 2154. Uh, and furthermore, uh, that this event happened comfortably within our uh, field of view and even within the 3 dB beam width of our field of view. Uh, and uh, we were indeed not the only experiment to detect this burst, CHIME FRB has uh, their own detection, uh, but it this burst occurred far outside of their field of view. And crucially, the sun, which is a frequent source of stair tube triggers, because it's usually kind of the only radio transient you get to talk about Megajansky from, uh, was outside of the field of view at the time, uh, so it is very inconsistent with coming from the sun. And if we zoom uh, onto the left here, uh, the, you can see stair two's localization region. This is 95% confidence, uh, which though crude is consistent with the position of 1935 plus 2154. And you can see Chime's approximate localization region here. But I think the best association comes from the FAST telescope, which is a 500 meter telescope in China. Um, and because they're a 500 meter telescope, their beam size is only three arc minutes. And a couple days after this very bright radio burst, uh, they found a burst that was seven orders of magnitude weaker uh, coming from within three arc minutes of the known position. And it had the same dispersion measure as the stair two and chime bursts. Uh, so things with this radio burst with this dispersion measure are coming from in the sky direction are coming from within three arc minutes of this magnetar. So 
Uh, there was also an X-ray burst at uh, the same time as the radio bursts. And you can see that uh, Chimes burst one and Stair, two, and Stair two's bursts are very close in time to these substructures in the X-ray light curve. Um, however, there is uh, comfortably a seven millisecond delay between the radio bursts arriving and then the peak of the X-ray emission. Uh, but uh, perhaps the relative timing of these structures is interesting. Uh, this was also a fairly, this is not a typical SGR burst uh, because it was much harder. I think the flux peaked at around 80 keV, uh, whereas a typical SGR burst from this magnetar would peak at like 30 to 40 keV. Uh, so it is indeed much harder than a typical X-ray burst. Um, so again, we're not the only experiment to see uh, this bright radio burst chimed it as well. And they saw two bursts instead of one. Uh, and their second burst is entirely consistent with uh, the burst that STAIR2 detected. So now I want to switch gears a bit and be a bit provocative that we should be including fast radio bursts in this class of uh, neutron stars um, and try to convince you that perhaps most fast radio bursts come from magnetars like those in the Milky Way. And the first question uh, you might ask is, could, how far out could this burst have been seen? And is it visible from extragalactic distances? And the answer is yes. It could have been seen by fast out to about 70 megaparsecs. So we can uh, tick that box. Uh, the host galaxy of this, uh, of this event is also not particularly surprising for FRBs as uh, FRB, FRBs have been localized to galaxies similar to the Milky Way in star formation rate and stellar mass. Uh, and we've even seen fast radio bursts that are coming from uh, the spiral arms of star forming spiral galaxies, uh, which is kind of like SGR 1935 plus 2154. So here we have the radio transient phase space. And on the y axis, we have the luminosity of a radio transient. And on the x axis, we have the duration of that radio transient. And you can see that our event shown here is most similar to the fast radio bursts, although it is approximately 30 times less energetic than the faintest extragalactic FRB. However, the reason there's a cutoff here in the FRB distribution is not because lower luminosity FRBs don't exist, but that our telescopes are not sensitive enough to find them. And furthermore, uh, we do expect a galactic survey to be sensitive to this uh, low luminosity FRB population. Uh, as if you ask the question, how long do I have to wait to see an FRB in a particular galaxy? The answer is much longer than a PhD timescale. However, if low luminosity FRBs are more common than high luminosity FRBs, then there is hope that you would detect uh, a galactic analog of an FRB in a particular galaxy on a PhD timescale. Three minutes. Yeah, so assuming that fainter FRBs are more common than brighter FRBs, galactic surveys are more sensitive to this low luminosity population, and our extragalactic surveys are only seeing the tip of the FRB iceberg. And using this uh, kind of logic, we made a prediction in our uh, instrument paper uh, about what a galactic fast radio burst would look like and found that it would have an energy of about 10 to the 26 ergs per hertz. And indeed, this event has an energy of about 10 to the 26 ergs per hertz. And the energies of what we currently call a fast radio burst span about six orders of magnitude. So I think it's reasonable to include this factor of 30 uh, considering the relative sensitivities of different FRB surveys. So another part of, important part of the story is the rate of these types of events. Uh, and because we know our on sky performance and how much of the sky we're looking at, uh, we uh, can estimate a uh, all sky rate and assuming that FRBs track star formation, turn that into a volumetric rate. Uh, and we find that these happen at about, these kind of events happen about 10 to the eight, there's about 10 to the eight per cubic gigaparsec per year of these 1935 plus 2154 like events. And uh, this 
is consistent with the extrapolation of what we know about the FRB luminosity function uh, from the ASCAP flies eye sample. Uh, so the rate here matches uh, the extragalactic FRBs. So with all this information, I believe it's reasonable to conclude that most FRBs are magnetars, as this event could have been seen out to an extragalactic distance. It's less energetic than other FRBs, but we kind of expected this based off of the properties of both galactic and extragalactic fast radio burst surveys. And the volumetric rate of these types of events agrees with those uh, of the extragalactic fast radio bursts. Uh, and furthermore, it's not a surprise that we did find an FRV in a Milky Way light galaxy in an object that is related to star formation. Uh, so now I just want to take a minute and say thank you to everyone who contributed significantly to this project. Uh, as even a small student-led project like this takes a village, and uh, this result wouldn't have been possible without everybody's contributions. Uh, so with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you, Chris. That's very interesting work. Uh, we have a question from Solon Bauman. Is the seven millisecond delay between X-ray and radio burst physical? If so, why is there a delay? Yeah, so the I, I, I believe that this delay is uh, physical as we've taken to, into account things like dispersion measure. And I think even with like systematic uncertainty in the dispersion measure, there is definitely a delay of several milliseconds between the radio burst and the peak of the X-ray emission. Um, and I know that people like in the Margalit and Metzger uh, model of uh, this plasmoid being ejected from the magnetosphere of um, a, from the magnetos from the magnetar's magnetosphere uh, that it would shock the, uh, shock the surrounding medium, produce a radio burst, uh, heat, up, heat up and cool uh, a cloud of stuff. So what we're seeing is like the cooling time, in this model at least, it would be like the cooling time between, um, yeah, it would be the cooling time of that cloud of shocked, X, of shocked X-ray emitting gas. Um, in the models that are inside of the magnetosphere, I've had a bit of a harder time uh, reconciling that the radio burst came first because in those models, the, um, there's an X-ray burst, the magnetic energy is released producing uh, an X-ray burst, uh, which uh, then kind of, you need to wait for the shock wave to travel to the part of the light cylinder where it's open, uh, where there are open field lines. And then uh, you can produce a radio, and then once that energy propagates over to that part, uh, the, you can uh, accelerate particles and get a radio burst. Uh, so I think it's harder to explain the radio burst coming first there. Uh, but of course, uh, yeah, I don't think it's certain how exactly this burst was, emit was emitted. Great. Uh, and then I had a question for you. If we have any other questions, please enter them into the Q&A box. Um, the other question I had was that you mentioned that Chime had detected two bursts and you, oh, you detected one and yours is consistent with the second burst they detected. Uh, do you know why you didn't detect the first or were you able to, but did sensitivity or? If the burst was bright enough, we definitely would have seen it. Um, and I don't know if I have the relevant plot, if I included that. Uh, so it was in your visibility capability, uh, just. Yeah, this is a bit zoomed in, so we don't have the STAIR2 data there. But in the paper, uh, you can see that there's absolutely nothing in the STAIR2 data at the time of that first burst. And uh, you can see in CHIME's spectrum that it is getting weaker as you go to higher frequencies. Mm. Uh, so perhaps it's not uh, unexpected that we didn't see anything mm -hmm. uh, since the second burst was rising in intensity as you go up in frequency in the CHIME data. 
So your non-detection limit doesn't put a constraint, doesn't provide any valuable constraint or? Um, I guess that we know, we, we do know that it, uh, that, um, well, we do, pro we do provide a constraint and I think we put an upper limit of like 400 kilojansky milliseconds, uh, which is kind of comparable to the fluence of the chime burst. Mm -hmm. um, so we know it's weaker at this 1.4 gigahertz band um, but I don't know how much we can actually learn from that, given that, like, it's not uncommon to see very banded, uh, radio emission from FRB-like things. Great. Uh, we have a question from Nandarea. Uh, is there an FRB in the current catalogs that have an observational parameter somehow colliding with the interpretation of a young extragalactic magnetar? Yeah, so I guess I don't know if you, I would call, so when we talk about young magnetars, where we could be talking about different things, like there's the, uh, for FRB 121102, people kind of think it's like a 30 year old magnetar, whereas 1935 is like a three kilo year old magnetar. So there's a large discrepancy in age for what we think those two sources are. Uh, the most, I, I don't think there are any observations that, really rule out like that you couldn't explain with a magnetar. Uh, there is a host galaxy association where the uh, FRB appears to be in the halo um, of a galaxy. Uh, however, I, yeah, it, there's also a really faint uh, 26 magnitude source on top of this uh, galaxy. And I think uh, that it's unclear whether this really faint source or the uh, brighter kind of offset host galaxy is the real host. Um, but uh, there's a good argument to be made that the brighter host and it's in the halo is a reasonable interpretation. So um, yeah, I think that would be hard to explain with a magnetar born like those in the Milky Way, but could be explained by something like a magnetar born in a neutron star merger. Um, or it could be something else. So I think it, that's waiting for more observations to find more things like that. Uh, but for the moment, I think everything is pretty consistent. Great. Or at least explainable with the magnetar hypothesis. But I, of course, I don't really think that this will be the end of the story. Thank you a lot. Thanks again a lot for a great talk and a good Q&A. Uh, we can now open up the Q&A to all the speakers in the session. If you have a question, a pressing question you wanted to ask for any of the speakers in the session, let me know. Um, just put it into the Q&A and we can address it. Or if our speakers want to comment, uh, with each other on any of their talks, that's also fine. Chris, I apologize. I had paused my timer on your Q and A, and so uh, I just kept sending you the questions. <laughs> oh no worries, I'm happy to answer them. <laughs> okay, if there's no further questions. Then I'd like to thank our speakers again for an excellent session and ex both the, this session and the previous session. I think we covered quite a range of topics of neutron stars and magnetars. Thank you all for making it an excellent uh, day of neutron stars and magnetars. I hope to see you tomorrow for our AGN session. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.